go. Okay. Hi, good morning. I'm Rick Talley from Netherlands School. Uh, on behalf of myself, Scott Reese, Eric Stevens, who are here, I want to welcome you all to Intercom. We've been sponsors with Intercom for over 20 years and happy to see everybody here again and thank the Intercom team for the conference. Happy to introduce our next company, APA or Apache. They're a Houston-based company, both domestic and international assets across the world, uh, both conventional and unconventional. Gary Clark, their Vice President of Investor Relations, is here to tell their story. Please welcome Gary. Thanks, Rick, and um, thanks to the Intercom team. Blanca and her team do a fantastic job, and this conference just seems to get better every year. I started coming back in uh, the mid-90s. I was at the first Intercom conference and uh, been fortunate enough to come out here and present at the last three, so this is my third year in a row and uh, really excited to be here. It's really my favorite conference of the year. So let me dive right in. Um, these are our standard disclosures. Please read them in your spare time on our website. I do want to say um, that when I do this presentation, I tend to talk about equity sector performance. I sometimes talk, talk about other stocks and potential performance as well as outlooks around oil prices and things like that. So all future outlooks and opinions on things of those matters are solely my opinion and not necessarily representative of the opinion of Apache Corporation. Um, so agenda for today and those of you that saw me the last couple years here, um, I like to do probably two-thirds of this presentation talks about the energy sector and my views of how it's performing and how it might perform in the future. And, and so I'll spend two-thirds on that and about one-third on Apache. If you feel like I haven't spent enough time on Apache, uh, just give me a call or send me an email anytime. I'd be happy to spend time with each and every one of you uh, diving down further into our company. Uh, but I used to be a sell-side analyst, also used to be a buy-side analyst, and this is something I'm kind of passionate about, particularly given where we are in the energy cycle and the investment cycle. So I'll talk about that. I'm also going to add this year a very brief high-level look at oil fundamentals uh, because I think it's interesting that's the biggest pushback that I get as I talk to institutional investors around it, attracting them to both the Apache story as well as the sector in general. Uh, then we'll get into our Apache overview and then I'll close with a few comments and slides revisiting what I talked about at Intercom last year. So this is a, always a fun chart to start with. Uh, I came to Intercom two years ago in August of 21. We were coming out of COVID. I gave the keynote address at, the, at lunch. And rather than just getting up and speaking about Apache, um, or APA rather, uh, I decided to, to go ahead and talk about where we were in the energy cycle. And at the time, the thesis was, look, coming out of COVID, we, we just made a long-term major secular and cyclical bottom in the energy sector. And, and long story short, great time to buy energy stocks. Um, that has been some pretty good performance over the last two years. The black line is the uh, S&P infotech sector, and the blue line, of course, is energy. So very gratifying to see. I think, though, even though this has been some big time outperformance over the last two years, uh, the, what I'm going to talk about is we're at the very beginning still of a long-term cycle, and I think there's a lot more to go, and you'll hear me say that a few more times during this presentation. So this slide is a little bit active. I'll take a, a minute or two to describe what we're looking at. The black line is really the technology companies uh, dating back to 1994. And what, did I, what I wanted to show here was we, we obviously all knew the tech bubble in the, the late 90s, early 2000s when uh, tech reached well over 50% of the S&P 500 in terms of, of uh, re representation of, in terms of the stocks. And if you go down to the bottom there, the red line is the S&P energy sector was only 5.5%. Um, then we saw a period of about eight or nine years after the bubble where tech dramatically underperformed and energy had a tremendous run. I hope some of you were here for that and caught that. Ultimately, energy hit 16% of the S&P 500 and nearly tripled off the bottom, and tech almost got it cut in half. And so we had a nice run there, and then we had another cyclical turn where energy turned down, and, and we can now see we're only 4.5% of the uh, S&P 500, and tech went on another, let's call it, strong run, 
and uh, is, is now uh, in about its 12th year of outperformance. Uh, really, outperformance ended in 21. Uh, but you can see, I would describe tech as still being in bubble territory. Some might want to debate me on that. Um, but the point of this is this is a very stretched dynamic. It's, it's more stretched, actually, than it was back in 1999, which 2000, which would have been a fantastic time to get involved in energy. And probably what's most interesting about this chart for me is the green is WTI oil price. And if you look back to 1999 during the tech bubble, oil was ranging between $10 and $30 a barrel. Companies were going bankrupt. Nobody was making any money. If we fast forward to today, we're over $80 a barrel, making lots of money, disciplined uh, uh, capital models, the way we're running our businesses, uh, strong balance sheets, make, throwing off a tremendous amount of free cash flow. So world of difference between the two periods, and yet energy still represents less than it did back in late 1999. So again, all of this points to, I think, Energy is really the other side of tech. And so as tech comes down off the bubble territory, there's a lot of factors we're gonna see energy, drive energy up. This is a, a fairly rudimentary chart, but I think it makes a, a pretty good point. Energy up at the top. The black dot represents PEs in the market for the 11 sectors of the S&P 500. Energy is almost always the cheapest, so that's no surprise there. Uh, but what we see in the, the turquoise or the blue bubble there is that on a cash flow per basis, share basis, the energy sector is contributing the most cash flow per share of any of these sectors. So it's punching way above its weight class in the S&P 500, and it's not getting credit for it. And we'll talk a little bit about institutional allocations and why that's the case. Um, I would have lost a bar bet on this chart before I put it together, uh, but it's a, it's a latest 12-month performance of uh, the blue line being the S&P energy sector and the black line being Infotech. So with all of the hype and AI and the magnificent seven tech stocks and all the things that we've seen unfolding in the market over the last six months, energy has still outperformed tech. Uh, and this is as of Thursday, so uh, Friday, I think it, it added a little bit more to that, that outperformance. And so despite a 7% drop in oil prices over the last year, and an absolute plunge in natural gas prices, we see that the energy stock still outperforms tech. And that's just the power of being in a very early stage part of this cycle. And again, I think there's more to go. And, and this slide is really meant, we've all seen this slide. This is the sector performance. Uh, I've taken it back to 2010, which was really when energy started to underperform dramatically. Uh, we see that it's on the far right side of the page and just massively underperformed Infotech by a factor of 12x. And so if you're a capital allocator, or you're just interested in uh, the energy space and investing in energy, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, this is going to be a powerful dynamic as energy moves to the left over, this, on, over the time on this page. As tech moves to the right, we're going to see massive performance divergences, and I just think we have a number of years where energy is just going to keep outperforming. It'll be very volatile, um, but if you're a, a long-term focused investor, I think this is an important dynamic to, to focus on. So let me quickly transition to oil fundamentals. I am not a, an oil expert. There's many people at this conference that are um, just absolute wizards at counting barrels and understanding oil market dynamics. That is not me. Um, I'm a high-level remedial, uh, almost cartoonish, uh, take a cartoonish approach to looking at the oil markets. And so I like to create very simple charts. But the reason I'm doing this is the biggest pushback that I get when I talk to institutional investors is they're afraid of oil and they're afraid of an oil price collapse. And so let's just walk through a few slides and see if we can get comfortable with, with where the oil um, fundamentals sit. So this is OPEC plus, so it includes Russia liquids production. Uh, we haven't gotten back anywhere near the pre-COVID production highs. There's a lot of reasons for that. But you've seen we've made a nice move off the COVID bottom. And what I want to highlight is, is over the last roughly year or so, we've seen a downtick in, in production from this group of 850,000 barrels a day. Uh, but that's actually, it's actually been more like 1.7 million barrels a day downtick um, in, the, in the Gulf states uh, uh, countries. 
But what we've seen is that's been offset by five countries, Iran, Venezuela, Nigeria, Libya, Russia, who've really had a nice bump in their production over 800,000 barrels over the last year. And so you've got countries that have spare capacity in the Gulf states, specifically Saudi, deliberately holding barrels off the market. Um, they've essentially stated to the market, we're gonna defend something around 80, $85 Brent. Uh, when the Saudis say that, you should listen to them because they've had a pretty good track record. So they're holding barrels off the market and then we're depending on countries that are not on my bucket list to visit Iran, Venezuela, Nigeria, Libya, Russia, to try to make up for that. And um, it's possible that some people believe they still have spare capacity and they can keep adding production. Um, but I don't want to count on that long term to uh, satisfy the world's energy needs. And I hope the bears aren't, crude bears aren't counting on that as well. So production is in good shape with OPEC. How about US oil production? It's booming. We've almost reached our pre-COVID high of 13 million barrels. The, the challenge is our rig count is much, much lower than it was. Uh, that's because we're drilling longer laterals and we're a lot more efficient. But over the last year, that rig count has actually flattened out. And over the last eight weeks, we've seen the US rig count, oil rig count roll over pretty darn hard. And so when you're growing at that kind of a clip, and your rig, people start dropping rigs, uh, it, you're pushing on a string. And so, again, I, I've seen some very optimistic outlooks from some of the macro folks on how much US oil production is gonna grow. Given this dynamic of rigs rolling over, it's gonna be very hard to push over that 13 million barrels in the US. Um, and by the way, this is just Permian oil rig count that we've used here, but that's the main driver. Uh, let's look at ducks, and this should not be underestimated. Coming out of OPEC, we had over 3,500 drilled uncompleted wells sitting in the Permian. Um, it's a very capital efficient thing to do to draw down your duck inventory um, because it's basically half the capital to generate the barrels. And as a result, we've generated that big ramp post COVID in oil production. The problem is we now sit at 860 ducks. And a lot of those we like to refer to as dead ducks because they're downspaced too far, um, they're drilled on fringes, there's mechanical issues, et cetera, et cetera. So you're down to an inventory where not, not a whole lot more of those 860 are actually going to be completed. So when you run through an inventory like this and you stop drilling or you start laying, letting rigs go, it's just going to be really hard to grow the U.S. production stream. And my personal belief is a lot of overly optimistic estimates about what the Permian is going to be able to deliver. So let's take a look at demand, and, and demand is, um, this is a projection, we're not there yet, but the S&P Global Platts May issue is estimating we'd get to 102.7 uh, this year, and that would eclipse the pre-COVID highs. So demand is very robust. Um, you hear a lot of things about the Chinese economy, and and uh, air travel and, and gasoline consumption and all these things, but the reality is demand has ramped right back up onto trend. I have no idea if this is gonna continue. Not a, not a demand expert. Wouldn't even wanna guess what's gonna happen here. But the point is, it's come roaring back off the COVID lows and for all the worries folks have about the worldwide economy right now, it's still very robust. But this is, of all the things that are sitting out there, the boogeyman that keeps institutional investors up at night is this fear of a demand collapse. And so the only thing I'll say about that is yes, we may go in a recession, I have no idea, it's not my area to try to predict, but if we do, the average recession would yield a two, maybe three million barrel drop. So it's a fraction of what we lost in COVID. And what we also learned is that when you have a big demand impact like that, supply adjusts very quickly. So the bottom line is, uh, yes, demand uh, may keep going. It may come down. If it does come down, we think supply adjusts and it's going to keep a, a nice floor on energy stocks. How about inventories? So this is a combination of both U.S. commercial inventories and the SPR, which we all know has been drained down to very, very low levels. But when you combine those two, we haven't seen inventory levels in the U.S. of crude this low since 1985. Now, we may never refill that SPR, but even so, commercial, the commercial element of this, the commercial inventories are quite a bit below the, the average, 10-year average of where we sit. So there's no excess whatsoever in U.S. crude inventories. 
we move to U.S. refined products. And so what I've done here is I've just combined gasoline and distillates, uh, just to make it simple. Uh, the black line is where we sit today, the uh, dotted red line, 10-year seasonally adjusted average. And so inventories for refined products in the U.S. sit well, well below uh, the average levels. So again, there's no apparent excesses anywhere that we can see, whether it's supply or inventories in the U.S., in the worldwide, you know, crude market fundamentals today. Um, some would argue that, yes, the fact that Saudi and others have some capacity they could bring back on is a threat to the markets, but clearly there's an objective to defend a certain price. We probably don't see those voluntary barrels coming back on until um, those countries feel that things have stabilized. So what I envision here, and I'm not predicting a big $150, $200 crude ramp or something like that, a super spike scenario, people smarter than me uh, think about that and it's a possibility. But the way I talk to investors is, look, you've got a pretty good downside cushion here in the form of very low inventories. Those inventories are continuing to draw right now. Even if we go into a recession, OPEC's been very di disciplined. Uh, supply will, will adjust quickly. And it's pretty easy to see a scenario where, where maybe your low side case is 60, 65 bucks. And that's still not a bad case because the, the EMP stocks are discounting somewhere around 65 today, maybe 70, but institutional investors are so fearful of oil prices and recession that they've been unwilling to capitalize more than about a $65, $70 price into these stocks longer term. So the picture looks pretty good. I, I don't worry about uh, crude. Gas, gas, natural gas, I'm not gonna cover. Um, too many elements and not enough time, but our general view uh, both my view and Apache's view is that 23 should be a pretty durable bottom in terms of average natural gas prices, um, and then we should should be up in 24 and then up, up more from there. So if we're making a, a nice cyclical bottom in natural gas, that's just another tailwind for the group. So let me jump here to the Apache overview. Uh, I'll cover four or five slides, and then I'll uh, close it out. So we have a global portfolio, a diversified strategy, onshore, offshore. Uh, we have shale, we have uh, long cycle exploration, uh, and we have product diversification, and that's what these charts show, and that's how we like it. About 50% of our uh, production on the corporate level is oil, and um, about 80% of our revenue. We do have some gas leverage in the U.S. with our Alpine High Play, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, most of you probably know we have three operating areas, North Sea, Egypt, U.S., and then a, a big exploratory appraisal um, operation in Suriname. So I think if you want to take anything away from the Apache portion of this presentation, and as one analyst put it, we have a convergence of catalysts. It's pretty much happening right now. So I think it's a good time to get involved with the stock. Uh, the four key things to know, we're delivering uh, for the first time in about three years very robust oil growth in the U.S. and Egypt, about 10% year-over-year oil growth in both of those regions, and it's coming at a nice time when oil has, has moved up nicely, so a lot of our oil growth is coming in the back half of this year, so we'll have good cash flow leverage. Um, since the guidance we provided at the start of the year, we've reduced our capital and our operating costs by about $250 million this year. Some of that's a combination of service costs, some of it's um, just sort of what we call self-help things, costs we've taken out of the system, and some of it is some activity reductions, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. And then um, our Chenier gas supply contract, which exposes us to, to world LNG prices, is another signif very significant uplift in the second half of the year in, in cash flow. And then lastly, we've had some very positive results in Suriname with our Crab Dagu discovery. So in the U.S., just real quickly, five rigs in the Permian. We've been operating five for a while. We plan to operate five for a while, uh, generating nice roughly 10% oil growth there. Not targeting gas right now. We've deferred all of our alpine high activity until the gas markets improve. Um, and we've had an uptick in our turn-in lines, which, which give us high confidence that we're going to continue to grow this oil production. And you can see the oil production in the bottom uh, corner of the chart there. That's moving up nicely. We expect it to move up in the third and then again in the fourth. 
Uh, Egypt, largest oil producer in country, been there a long time, great relationships. We've now ramped up after some growing pains to a 17 rig program. Uh, we love the drilling efficiencies, the well connections, recompletions, everything is kind of humming along uh, exactly as we would have hoped at this point. We have a 50% increase in our well completions in the second half of the year. It gives us high confidence that we're going to see a very nice upturn in oil production in the back half of the year. Uh, North Sea, uh, some of you may or may not be following what's happening there with the tax uh, situation in the North Sea, but uh, uh, the EPL tax has is, is, is been an issue for us. It's now a 75% tax rate. We released our Ocean Patriot drilling rig, um, and we also have, have stopped platform drilling there. Uh, we're going to operate safely. We're going to maintain those assets. We're going to try to stem our production declines. We generate a lot of free cash flow, uh, but we're not going to commit uh, capital at this time. So I think I'm starting to run out of time, but I want to touch on Suriname. Um, Suriname, we said a lot on the 2Q call about this. I'll go quickly. We have an area in the south or the central east portion of Block 58 that's been well delineated now. We have Sapacaro, which is 600 million plus barrels of resource in place connected. And we're in the process of finishing up our analysis on Crab Dagu. We've drilled two appraisal wells there. Uh, we've said we've identified a, 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 long, um, a long fairway, 14 kilometers between the Discovery Well and Crab Dagu 3. There's three separate oil zones. Um, it's, it's a bit complex. It's not all one big block of blocky reservoir. Um, but it's a lot of resource to work with. It's going to take us a little more time to uh, define that, let the technical teams come back with a resource number, and we hope to be back to the market with that soon. But the bottom line is we're tracking well towards uh, an oil hub project. We've not declared FID on that project yet. I want to stress that. Um, but we're making very, very good progress in CERNOM. Um, balance sheet, good progress here as well. Since the end of 2020, we've reduced our bond debt outstanding by 40%. Uh, upgrades by Moody's and Fitch to investment grade. We hope to hear from S&P soon, and that'll get all three of the agencies up to uh, investment grade. Don't know if we'll get there with S&P, but we're hopeful. And uh, I think an important point that we're proud of, we've repurchased 20% of our shares since October of 21, since we put in our capital return program. And we've done that at $34 a share, which is about $10 below the current stock price. So that's very value accretive, um, that sort of capital activity for us. And then lastly, um, the debt maturity profile is excellent. It's 15 years, uh, two thirds of that matures after 2037, uh, the, the one third of that matures before. Um, 2030, um, but we have no maturities for the next couple of years, and it's easily manageable, and we'll likely just pay down this debt between now and 2030 with no problem. So quickly close, I want to go back to Intercom 22. Um, I, I wanted to show this to highlight the dichotomy between uh, the valuation between energy and tech. This is sort of a silly example, but I thought it'd be fun. Uh, APA versus Apple. Um, you'll note that at the time, the consensus 23 PE ratio for Apache was 3.2 times, Apple was 25.5, and our free cash flow yield was 24%, Apple's was 4%. And my point was simply, this is very stretched, it wasn't a stock recommendation, but I was just pointing out the love for tech stocks and the uh, lack of embracement of energy stocks. So then we took a look, we wanted to follow the smart money here, and we wanted to see what Warren was doing. And since 2019, he had been buying a lot of Oxy, which is his big energy position, and he had been trimming Apple. And so whatever that means, we just took note of that. And the, the result over the last 12 months since those charts went up, Apache's had a nice run. Both stocks are up, but Apache's had quite a bit of outperformance. So I wanted to look at what is Warren doing now. Um, I don't know what he's doing today, but we know since Intercom 22 over the last year, and this surprised me a bit, he's added aggressively to both positions. I was a bit surprised at how much Apple that he had added. Um, but when you dig down to, to what price he added that at, it was at $147 a share. It's about $30 below where Apple trades today. So if you're buying and chasing Apple today, uh, you once again got beat to the punch by Mr. Buffett. He's adding Oxy, and, and his, his average over the last year, I think, was in the low 60s. So he's kind of adding Oxy right here. What that tells me is he thinks Oxy's a pretty good value. 
Apple might need to come down a bit before he thinks it's a good value. So why, let me just go back, why am I talking about all this? Um, it's, it's just kind of a fun thing to do, but I think it just really highlights the difference between how the market approaches tech stocks and how it approaches energy stocks. And what I would say to you is if you own, um, we all own probably more Apple than we think we, want, we own or that we want to own because it's the largest uh, stock represented in the ETFs and the indexes. So just think about your weightings. Do you really want to own stocks with these types of valuations when we're at what could be the start of a long-term energy valuation uh, up cycle? And then lastly, I'll just close with that to highlight that point. Uh, this is from Josh Silverstein at UBS. The dichotomy between uh, the S&P, this is just S&P 500 stocks in blue, and the energy sector, uh, is it's a massive difference between the EBITDA multiple. So I think energy is not expensive, it's low risk, and relative to everything else, I think it looks really attractive. So hopefully that's helpful. If you have any questions um, about that or Apache, please call me. Happy to talk through it and look forward to speaking with everybody in the breakout.